again, everybody. Uh, Josh again. Uh, it is week six at Norwich. I don't know why there's trash everywhere. Uh, I hope you guys will forgive me for the fact that my room looks like absolute garbage at the moment. Uh, uh, this quarantine shit is not fun, and this is basically where I spend all my time when I'm not at work. Uh, since the gyms are closed and all the trails are closed, I haven't been running much, so basically I just sit in my room and do nothing, and primarily homework. Um, I have a little bit of a sinus infection. Uh, the weather in Indiana is always just bipolar as fuck, so I mean, it was 86 degrees, I would say, about a week and a half ago, and then today it's about... 39 with a pretty significant wind chill and on and off rain. So it is what it is. I'm not sick, uh, so I can still go to work. Uh, I am wearing a mask, though. Be sure to practice good social distancing and um, uh, smart choices when you go out in public. The last thing any of us want to do is be cooped up in our houses uh, for the remainder of the summer, uh, if we're even going to have one. I, from the best of my knowledge, uh, Madison actually just canceled uh, for the first time in a long time uh, regatta, which I mean I didn't really enjoy big public events like that anyways, but I did enjoy seeing my friends and shit down there. So stay at home, stop going out and being fucking stupid. Anyways, so uh, that aside, week six was primarily uh, focused on the Marxist school of historiography or history. Uh, it Eh. so the readings again i think it was it was actually a little bit lighter this week than it was uh, for most other weeks i know marxism is pretty complicated and if you don't really uh dig into the source material it's kind of e very easy to interpret marxism as a sort of economic determinism uh it's a mistake that a lot of people make and i can understand why especially given uh the relative density at which marx and engels write a lot of their shit um, we didn't actually, I think outside of just the very basic writings of, of Engels, so we read, I think, two or three excerpts, or longer excerpts, about 50 pages each, uh, so about 150 pages worth of readings out of uh, uh, Das Kapital. Well, uh, I'd already read the Communist Manifesto before, so I didn't really want to reread that one. I, if I needed to do some quote mining, then I did that, but other than that, I didn't really... Uh, re-engage with that material anyways. Uh, other than that, uh, we looked at two readings. I can't remember who the other author was uh, because, again, I, I primarily focused on the second author to do my um, author article analysis on him. Uh, but the one that I did my author article analysis on was uh, Gabriel Kolko. 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 It's K-O-L-K-O. -O. Uh, he was an American historian and political scientist. Uh the, how best to describe Kolko? Uh, the best way I could put it is he was very center left in some instances and very new left and Marxist in others. Uh, the, the article that we looked at uh, uh, for this particular instance was an analysis over um, economic connections between the United States and Germany uh, during the 1930s and then throughout the war, uh, with the principal focus being that there seemed to be a sort of, um, greater emphasis on maintaining a sort of class solidarity and, um, private economic and global interests between businesses, even though the business press, uh, was openly, uh, disseminating material that would rather vehemently suggest that the Nazis uh, were not to be trusted, not to, uh, that Nazism was not applicable to the capitalist pursuits of the United States or the free market pursuits of the United States. Um, if I can find a link to it uh, that will work for you guys, I don't know how JSTOR actually does a lot of the shit with like, or I could just download the PDF. I might put that in the uh, comment section for those interested, but um, back to what the article, the central thesis of the article was, is that uh, businesses in the 1930s and even through the 1940s maintained a principal view that moral and political considerations aside, uh, didn't really matter. Um, it didn't really matter that these businesses knew that they had connections with the principal source of German remilitarism, which was IG Farben. Uh, everything from U.S. Steel to General Motors to a litany of just major U.S. companies maintain connections with Farben or um, satellite companies of Farben uh, to maintain business interests with them, despite full well knowing um, that 
uh, Farben was, again, the principal source of German militarization throughout the 30s and then the principal supplier of the Nazi war effort, or a principal, one of the principal suppliers of the Nazi war effort all throughout uh, the years leading up to the war and during the war. And the reason for this, Kolko asserts or argues, is that uh, in the business world, there is a significantly greater emphasis on the private interests of the business and maintaining a sort of class solidarity that ensures global and local economic security. Um, It's a very – I don't even want to say it's a Marxist approach in history. I know that um, class conflict and this notion of class is just a principal focus in Marxist history or at least Marxist Marxist history. But it didn't really seem like that was what he was doing. He seemed – even though he concludes that there was a sort of – this was all principally out of a sort of class solidarity thing, he – it's a – it's a very evidence-based approach with how he does things. And, 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 and in the article, it's very much comparable to later New Left historians than it is, uh, per se, to more um, uh, centrally focused historians who belong to the Marxist school. So I don't really want to call it a completely Marxist histor- his, uh, article, but there, there are elements of Marxism in there. Um, as for what the essential... Uh, components of the Marxist school of historiography or history are, uh, essentially speaking, it is a mode of history that uses the meta narrative or a single meta narrative of class, class conflict to establish uh, historical progression. So essentially speaking, all historical progression is by default from feudalism all the way to capitalism to eventually to communism, and all of this can be sort of analyzed, compiled, and viewed, and so on and so forth under the umbrella notion of class conflict or class. Um, obviously, with that, the principal criticism of that is that it's it's a very it's essentially meta narrative that oversimplifies a great many things. Uh, another is this that inherent within Marxism, there's something known as uh, princi- or the principle of false consciousness. And our readings in Truman went over this pretty well. Uh, granted, Truman is a pretty conservative author, so I mean, take this how you will. I don't really think that Truman had a real political axe to grind, but it, it is relatively clear that uh, he's not a fan of Marxism. Uh, but in Truman's words, false consciousness is essentially an infallibility matrix that's built into the analysis inherent in Marxism. So what false consciousness is, is that any factor that could be considered not related to class or class consciousness can be dismissed as a sort of mass psychosis or delusion. And so Marxism has this sort of inherent infallibility complex built into the school of analysis to where essentially any criticism, any outside evidence can essentially just be dismissed as delusion or psychosis. And uh, the, the principal example that Truman gives of this is the example of Christopher Hill, another pretty famous historian, a uh, pretty famous adherent of the Marxist school and the Marxist ideology. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Christopher Hill was interviewed, and uh, the interviewer, of which I'm forgetting his name, I apologize, asked him, you know, what, did, what exactly did Mr. Hill or Professor Hill think of um, the Marxist ideology, or this, even the Stalinist ideology, of which it holds its roots in Marxism, given the fact of the famines, the mass murder, the political killings, so on and so forth, and Christopher Hill essentially said uh, that never happened. And then the interviewer, kind of, kind of stunned, was like, "What do you mean it didn't happen? We have all this evidence." And Christopher Hill essentially said that this is an example of false consciousness. No matter what evidence you show me, I can boil it down to uh, this is just propaganda. Um, and again, it just relates back to this concept that it, it, it never happened in any other criticism or evidentiary base could be dismissed as this sort of delusion or psychosis. So uh, that was pretty much it. We only had um, one discussion post this week over, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of Marxism. Uh, pretty easy. And then the author article analysis I did over Colco. And then I think this week, week seven, uh, I'm actually not sure what we're doing. I think it's popular history, sexual history or some shit like that. So, uh, yeah, that's about all I wanted to talk about this video. Um, I'll see you guys later.